Imagine this. You open up Windsurf in the zone, just swipe coding. You take a quick break, scroll through X, click on some random blog post, and somehow in the background, Windsurf's AI agent just handed control of your system to an attacker. Well, hello again. It's been a while since I made a hacking video. The last video I planned to post was about exploring whether AI could actually find security vulnerabilities. But I fell down a rabbit hole. I ended up spending months reverse engineering the entire ecosystem. I read tons of papers, reverse engineered multiple AI applications, and even hired a few interns to help build datasets, design benchmarks, and create the scaffolding to test them. And as a hacker, once you learn how things work, your brain flips to one question. How do I break it? Today, we're going to explore breaking windsurf. I'm going to show you how that single malicious link tricks the AI agent into handing us a shell on the target system. And that rabbit hole led to something bigger than just a video. It led me to start a company, Hacktron.ai, where we do two things. Build AI agents that hack and hack AI agents that are built, starting with hacking windsurf. Let's dive in. Alright, before we dive into the actual vulnerability, let's quickly understand how these modern AI coding tools work, like Cursor, GitHub Copilot, or Windsurf. At a high level, they all follow a pretty similar workflow. When we send a message in the editor, something like fix this code or explain this function, the editor gathers all the context it needs to build the prompt. That includes things like our operating system version, the location of the project, all the relevant files, and the tools the model need to complete the task. Once that context is ready, the editor just sends the long prompt to the LLM and waits for the response. As the model responds, the editor updates the chart window. And if the LLM needs more info, like reading a file or running a command, the editor triggers the right tool sends the result back to the model and the loop continues until the task is over. Now this process is what they call the agentic loop. Think, act, observe until the task is done. Now building this agentic loop is not that hard. With a solid day of work, we can write this. But the real challenge is building the editor around it. Things like syntax highlighting, code navigation, workspace management, version control, keyboard shortcuts, and so on. Basically, everything that makes VS Code what it is. And since VS Code is open source, the smartest move is to just fork it and build on top of its extension API. That API gives us access to the UI, the file system, the terminal, and the editor state, everything we need to build a powerful editor. So yeah, that answers the question. Why does everyone fork VS Code? Because it's the same reason as all the new browsers are Chromium forks. It's just the easiest and most optimal thing to do. Anyway, but there is one key architectural difference between the Windsurf and the Cursor. Cursor runs everything inside the extension. Model calls, tool execution, agentic logic, all in JavaScript. This big mega JavaScript file. Windsurf on the other hand, takes a more modular approach. Its VS Code extension mainly handles the UI and UX, such as the chart window, inserting code, executing editor commands, and so on. But the actual agentic logic, calling the model, running tools, looping through actions, is offloaded to a separate Go binary called language server. So overall, when the Windsurf editor launches, its extension loads up and creates the chart window web view, and then it spawns the Go binary and now they both communicate together to run the Windsurf AI editor. Now, this architecture by Windsurf is actually pretty clever than Cursor because the Go-based agent is not tied to VS Code at all. They can plug it into JetBrains, Vim, or literally anything else. They just need to swap the UI and UX. That sums up how all these editors work. Now, let's talk about the bug. As Windsurf uses the Go binary, there has to be some kind of inter-process communication between the VS Code extension and that backend server. So, if we inspect the process, we can notice two exposed ports. 
one port exposed by the Golong Way server and another port exposed by the extension itself. At first glance, everything seems fine. We send a message in the editor, it gets forwarded to the Longway server, the Longway server sends it to the model, gets the response back, processes it and updates the editor. So far, so good. But the catch here is, if any of these ports are accessible from the browser, then any website we visit could potentially talk to that local server and browser won't stop it. Therefore, the Go server must be protected against these kind of attacks, usually with some form of authentication. Otherwise, it's wide open for attackers to pawn this server. To investigate this, we need to understand what kind of communication protocol the Go server and the extension is using and whether it's secure. Now, one way is the hard route, which is reverse engineering the Go binary. But for this bug, we don't need to go that far. We can just set up a proxy or open the VS Code dev tools and investigate from there. And sure enough, in the network tab, we can see that every time a message is sent in the chart window, there is a post request to the endpoint of the Go server. This request uses protobuf as the content type. Interestingly, if we look closely at the request headers, there is no authentication at all. It's just a plain request. This is a serious issue because if we can send the same request from the browser from any website, we can make the model run arbitrary commands. So the next step is creating an exploit to do that. To exploit this from the browser through a malicious website, we need to solve two things. First, figure out which port the Go server is listening on. It's random. And second, craft a valid protobuf payload that can send a command and make the model to run it. Now, finding the port is pretty straightforward. Since the Go server binds to a random localhost port, we can just brute force it from the browser. A simple script using fetch can do the job. It loops through the all ports and if there is a local port listening, it logs it. Next, to build a payload that communicates with the language server pretending to be the extension, we first need to understand the structure of the message, which is written in protobuf. That means digging into the extension JavaScript and following how it generates those protobuf messages. Once we extract the protobuf data structures, we can use protobuf.js to generate the payload and create the script that sends custom messages to the local Go server. To summarize what we are going to do, first, we're gonna find the random port and send a protobuf request with a message that tells the long server to run a system command all from a website opened in the browser. Now, all that's left is to host that payload somewhere and just visit the site. But when we load it, nothing happens. And if we check what's happening in the browser's network tab, there's an error. 415 unsupported media type, which is weird. Because as you can see here, we are trying to send a request with content type application proto, but the browser defaults to text plain for cross origin request. This is actually expected due to the same origin policy in action, unless the server explicitly allows that content type using cross origin resource sharing headers, the browser blocks it. And in this case, the language server doesn't send any course headers. So it looks like there's no way to reach that endpoint from our website, from our browser. Sounds like a dead end, right? But there's a way. Pause the video and try to figure it out if you want to. The answer for this is a classic technique, DNS rebinding. And yes, it still works even in modern browsers. So the idea is this. We set up a domain, let's say ctf.series.ninja with two A records. One points to our malicious server and other points to the local host. When a windsurf user visits our site, we start brute forcing the local port and once we find it, we begin sending our protobuf payload. At first, those requests will hit our server, which is ctf.series.ninja. But as soon as one goes through, we'll shut down our ctf.series.ninja server. At that point, the browser tries to make another request, but it fails to reach our server IP because we shut it down. So it falls back to the second A record, which resolves to localhost. Now, the browser thinks it's still on the same origin, but the traffic is actually being sent to the localhost. 
and this time the content type error doesn't happen because from the browser's perspective it's all coming from the same origin and we are not violating same origin policy so now the longest server receives the payload sends it to the ai model and the model responds with a command to execute the extension runs it and just like that calculator pops pretty cool right i reported the issue to the windsurf team they responded quickly patched it fast and awarded me $10000 and that's it for this one a cool neat bug i hope you learned something today and by the way everything in the llm ecosystem is moving so fast maybe too fast for the security to keep up so if you are a security researcher this is a space worth diving into and finding some cool bugs ah shameless plug we build ai agent that hacks across every layer of the software life cycle and we break ai systems too so check us out at hackron.ai and that's it for now see you next time peace